Hey there, I'm Mike Gillette, and thanks for tuning in to When Radio Ruled. This is the first in a series of podcasts devoted to classic radio programs. Back in the day, radio did the job your television and computer do now. Radio kept you entertained. Radio was the main source of news, comedy, drama, sports, popular music, and about a hundred other things. Everyone's living room furniture was arranged around the radio, and families argued over which show to tune into. The little chatter box, the one with pretty Auburn locks. Whom do you see? It's little orphan Annie. From Hollywood, the Jimmy Durante Show. The Adventures of the Falcon. Lux presents Hollywood, Joan Blaine in Valiant Lady. The story of a brave woman and her brilliant but unstable husband. Easy Aces, radio's distinctive laugh novelty. This is the house of mystery. Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. The Guiding Light. This is episode one, so we're going to start at the beginning back when we had the radio, but we didn't know what to do with it. Commercial radio technically begins when Pittsburgh station KDKA becomes the first licensed radio station and starts broadcasting every day. Their very first official broadcast was the election of November 2, 1920. This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We shall now broadcast the election returns. <clears throat> we are receiving these returns through the cooperation and by special arrangements with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun. We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us, as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching and how it is being received. While we're waiting for the returns to come in over the telephone, direct from the Post and Sun, I'll give you the list of offices in today's presidential election. Here they are. Some 30 million Americans are electing a president of the United States, a vice president, 34 United States senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives, governors of 34 states, and thousands of minor offices, county judges and officials. Okay, those are the offices to be filled. And here are the seven complete presidential tickets that are being voted on. Republican, Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge. Democratic, James M. Cox. That was a reproduction of the very first commercial radio broadcast in America. This reproduction was produced by KDKA because a recording of the real thing doesn't exist. There are very few radio shows that have survived from before 1932. Early on, recording a broadcast was very difficult, and not until the invention of lacquered discs in 1934 did it become easy to record a radio show as it went out over the air. So it is 1920. World War I just ended, and the world feels like it's starting all over again. The money is rolling in, jazz music and flapper girls, newfangled automobiles and aeroplanes seem to be everywhere. New inventions for the years 1920 to 1923 include Band-Aids, the Tommy Gun, lie detector, first robot, insulin, frozen food, traffic lights, the self-winding watch, and radio entertainment. Feasible radio technology was only about 20 years old when KDKA went on the air. In 1901, Marconi sent the first cross-Atlantic radio signal from England to Canada. It was the letter S in Morse code. Dit, dit, dit. Not very entertaining, but a breakthrough that amazed the science geeks. 
So radio was used as a wireless telegraph, transmitting Morse code for a few years, until in 1906, Reginald Fessenden created a device to transmit his voice by radio. He called it the wireless telephone. Fessenden sings a song, plays his violin, and reads a Bible passage in the first documented radio broadcast. And who was listening? Amateurs, mostly. Enthusiasts who were fascinated by the magic signals that traveled through the air. Lots of them built their own crystal radio sets. Others purchased inexpensive mail-order radios. But there wasn't much to listen to. Just Morse code chatter from military and commercial wireless telegraphs. It must have been awe-inspiring when these radio nuts heard, for the very first time, a human voice coming through their crude speakers and headsets. I imagine it felt like the voice of God. After that, a few experimental radio stations sprung up, backed by companies trying to make the best broadcast transmitter. These stations would occasionally broadcast phonograph records as tests of their signal. No regular scheduling or consistent programming, but the radio nuts tuned in anyway just in case someone was broadcasting. They couldn't help themselves. Then the big war came. The government shut down the handful of amateur radio stations and declared radio off-limits to civilians. Radio enthusiasts were ordered to stop listening to the airwaves. All radio patents and research came under the control of the military. During World War I, the military was directing all radio research, and one of the most promising technologies they were exploring was Lee DeForest's vacuum tube. In order to experiment with the DeForest vacuum tube, the government allowed Westinghouse Company engineer Frank Conrad to do some test broadcast to test his new style radio transmitter in Pittsburgh. Conrad played a phonograph record to test the signal and the audio. To his surprise, after Frank Conrad played the phonograph record to test his experimental transmitter, Conrad got some enthusiastic thank yous from radio nuts who were disobeying the government by listening to the airwaves. So Frank Conrad continued to broadcast records for his secret audience every Saturday night. After the war, Westinghouse executives put their heads together to come up with a plan how to make money from their radio technology. Because they built radios, the scheme they came up with was making money by selling radio sets. Not being complete idiots, Westinghouse realized that if you want people to buy radios, it helps to have something for these customers to listen to on the new radio they just bought. So Westinghouse turned Frank Conrad's experimental radio station into KDKA, the first licensed radio broadcasting station, and got Frank Conrad to run it for them. But what kind of programs to transmit? KDKA had to come up with at least six hours of programming a day. At first, it broadcast lectures, gardening tips, announcers read the newspaper, they played phonograph records, anything to fill the time. Slowly, Frank Conrad experimented with programming, trying to figure out what his audience wanted. On July 2, 1921, KDKA was part of the first national broadcast of the Jack Dempsey, George Carpentier fight by reading off a teletype from New Jersey. KDKA was the first station to broadcast Major League Baseball when it began covering the Pirates in 1921. Will Rogers made his very first radio appearance on KDKA. Hello, folks. I'm 
and looked out at you from the movie screen and the stage, but I never got a chance to talk to you at home before. Now, I'm not going to tell you any jokes. I, I, I just want to get acquainted with you and talk over the affairs of the day with you. Now, you take wars. They're a terrible thing, but as long as women are crazy over an officer's uniform, there's going to be war. But if we ever have another war, it's going to be right here on the home ground. No use paying transportation, going to Europe, hunting a war. Just think how cheap we could put on a war without a shipping board. Instead of paying rich men a dollar a year to help run it, why, just pay them what they're worth. That'd be a big saving. Foreign nations they wondered how we could train our soldiers to quit. That's because we only train them to go one way. Of course, what they need in the next war, and should have had it in the last one, is the referee. And the minute the war is over, let him announce who won and how much. Westinghouse bought up other small radio stations to expand their market for radios, but these stations each did their own programming. Westinghouse didn't yet have a network of radio stations sharing programs. One of these acquired properties, WJZ in Newark, New Jersey, decided to broadcast the New York nightclub singer, Miss Von DeLeaf, who would become known as the original radio girl and the first lady of radio. At the time, WJZ didn't have any broadcast schedule to speak of. Von DeLeith would show up at the microphone in the shack on top of the Westinghouse building in Newark and sing her heart out for three or four hours until someone else showed up to broadcast something. She became more popular as a radio singer than she ever was as a stage performer. <laughs> oil is good for rheumatism, so they declare. And olive oil is good upon a salad, also on the hair. Though we know that castor oil always cures the pain, banana oil is something new. So just let me explain. When he tells you, I adore you, that's banana oil. And she answers, I'll die for you, that's banana oil. He says, when I buy the stone, what a handsome ring you'll own. But the only ring she gets is on the telephone. You're the first boy ever kissed me. That's banana oil. And I wonder if you miss me. More banana oil. He says, I'll do right by now. Mother thinks that's simply swell. But Dad is wise and he knows right well. That's banana oil. Now standard oil is always advertising, we know that so They claim their oil is far more popular than any kind we know But there is still another oil, seems to rank supreme It's what we call banana oil I'll tell you what I mean When a girl says I'm just 20 That's banana oil And of money dad has plenty That's banana oil I wonder what's become of maids Used to wear their hair in braids When you took them dancing Ordered only lemonade Yes, my hair is naturally curly <laughs> That's banana oil, and I've got to be home early. More banana oil. Who says girls hate new clothes to wear? Who says older men won't stare? And who says our moths don't bob their hair? That's banana oil. <laughs> When he says, dear, you look charming, that's banana oil. And she says, I just love farming, more banana oil. Now, here's one thing, I'll tell you what, big oil men I've met a lot. But the only oil those birds have got is just banana oil. Pioneers of radio, like Von DeLeith, 
sold a lot of radios. Visit your neighborhood radio store and compare beauty against beauty, efficiency against efficiency, and performance against performance. See for yourself how ridiculous it is to consider out-of-date sets sold of necessity at cut prices when the new 1930 Brunswick may be bought for even less money. By the end of 1922, 25% of American families owned a radio. Three million radio sets listening to the 200 radio stations that had sprung up all over the country. And a radio was a big investment. Folks paid $50 to $150 for their radios. A new Ford Model T only cost $300, and the average household annual income was $1,000. So a radio was a considerable expense. But broadcasters knew that the quality of their shows weren't very good. There were still 75% of American families without radios, and the radio stations wanted better programming to keep the public tuning in and buying radios. In 1922, Westinghouse announced it was going to spend $5 million for radio talent. So radio stations started recruiting famous names from the vaudeville circuit, legitimate theater, journalism, sports, and movies. Singers, bands, comedians, and all kinds of celebrities were hired to appear on radio. Most performers weren't convinced that radio was going to last, but they were more than willing to take what they called electric money. The better radio entertainment got, the more people wanted to listen to the radio. By 1925, there were 563 radio stations in operation and sales of radios topped $44 million, five times the numbers from 1921. While the radio stations were figuring out what kind of programs to present, the big radio companies were linking together individual radio stations all across the country so that a national audience could all hear the same thing. Meanwhile, the businessmen had figured out that selling advertising on the radio made a lot more money than just selling radios. The first radio network was created in 1926 when competitors RCA, Westinghouse, and General Electric got together and leased phone lines from AT&T that allowed coast-to-coast -coast hookups between radio stations, forming the National Broadcasting Company. NBC actually formed two networks, NBC Blue and NBC Red, so it wouldn't look so obviously like a monopoly. The Blue Network was intended for more educational and cultural shows, and the Red Network was intended for NBC's popular entertainment shows. The two networks shared facilities and technical personnel. For big events, the two networks would broadcast the same thing, like the 1927 return of Charles Lindbergh to America where Calvin Coolidge made a speech honoring the great aviator that was broadcast from coast to coast. On behalf of his own people, who have a deep affection for him and have been thrilled by his splendid achievement, and as President of the United States, I bestow the Distinguished Flying Cross 
as a symbol of appreciation for what he is and what he has done upon Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh. When I landed at Le Bourget a few weeks ago, I landed with the expectancy and the hope of being able to see Europe. <laughs> it was the first time I had ever been abroad. And I wasn't in any hurry to get back. And I was informed that while it wasn't in order to come back home, that there'd be a battleship waiting for me next week. Calvin Coolidge had been the first president to give a speech on radio in 1923 when his State of the Union speech was transmitted by telephone hookup to radio stations that covered most of the country. But as popular as silent Cal Coolidge was, people wouldn't tune in every day to listen to him. The networks needed shows that people would listen to day after day. If radio was going to truly catch the public's imagination, it needed a breakthrough show that people would go crazy for, a show that would seem like an old friend, something that would increase radio sales and get the sponsor's sales pitch into more people's ears. In 1928, they got that show. It was a local Chicago show that was brought to the NBC Blue Network by sponsor Pepsodent. It was an overnight sensation, an American phenomena. It swept the country. When this show began in 1926, it was called Sam and Henry, although the name would change before it went network. It was a comedy about two best friends. No copies of the broadcast of Sam and Henry exist, but the two actors, Freeman Godston and Charles Carell, did record a series of phonographs of routines from the broadcast. Here's one recorded in 1926. Henry, that telephone ought to ring any minute now. The operator said that she'd call me back as soon as she could get to Birmingham, and that's been 30 minutes ago. I'm getting tired hanging around here waiting for you now. Wait a minute now, Henry, wait a minute. Don't rush off and leave me here. I gotta talk to Liza. Did the secretary tell you you could use this phone? Yeah, he told me to go ahead and use it, and then I could pay him after I finished talking to her. Well, you want to have your money ready. I got a lot of change right here in my hand. I'm getting madder and madder now. The longer I stay waiting for you to talk to that crazy gal, Liza, the madder I get. Wait a minute now, Henry. Wait a minute. Don't leave me here. There it is. There it is now. Take your time now. Take your time. Don't get so excited. Hello? Yes, ma'am. I'll call in Birmingham. What'd she say? What'd she say? She said she's ready with Birmingham to hold the line. And I'm getting all excited here. I've got a lot of things I'm going to tell Liza. Hello? Hello, is this Birmingham? I want to talk to Liza. Who's that you're talking to? That's the lady Liza works for, I guess. She's going to get Liza to the telephone. I can't hear very good either. Be careful now what you say to that gal. The first thing you know, you're going to be asking her to marry her. But that's what I want to do, Henry. Uh-oh. Oh. Now I know you, Fred. That's all right, though. That's all right. The longer it takes Liza to get to that phone, the more money it's going to cost you. You know that, don't you? Wait a minute now, Henry. Yes, she is. Hello? Hello, is this Liza? I want to talk to Liza. Liza! Don't holler so much. Don't holler so much. Wait a minute, Henry. Is this your Liza? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? This your Sam. No, no, this your Sam. Sam who? How many Sams did you got? See there, that's just what I've been telling you. This year is Sam Smith. I was up in Chicago. No, no, Chicago, Chicago. C-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-I-H-
Teach your ass Sam, Liza. Sam Smith. Is you crazy? Is you crazy? No, no, teach your ass Sam. Shut up. Shut up. Wait a minute. Can it don't mess with me while I'm talking to Liza? Hello, Liza. Do you know who this is? This your ass Sam you was talking to. I believe you're talking to yourself. Wait a minute, Henry. If this your Liza I'm talking to, I can't hear you. But if you can hear me, this your ass Sam. Sam Smith. I write you a letter. When? When? Here comes the secretary. Yes, I'm the secretary. Hello? Hello? Henry, whoever I was talking to done hung up. Well, hang up yourself then. That's the craziest talk I done ever heard. I couldn't hear what you were saying either. There she is again. Now, wait a minute. Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am. I talked to Birmingham. What's that? The charges is $5.25. How much is it again? $5.25? Yes, ma'am. I'll pay the secretary. Goodbye. There's a secretary standing over there right now. Go ahead. Get your money ready. Mm-mm. That sure is a lot of money, ain't it? I wonder if I was live I was talking to. Don't make no difference who you've been talking to. Go on. Pay the secretary. Doggone. That takes all the money I've got. But come on. Let's pay him. Go ahead. Pay him. I ain't never heard a word you said yet. Sam and Henry became Amos and Andy. And Amos and Andy became the biggest thing in America. When they were on the air, more than half of the radios in the country were listening. Movie theaters lost so much business when Amos and Andy were on that some theaters would stop the film and play the Amos and Andy broadcast so moviegoers wouldn't go home to listen to their radio. The Mystic Knights of the Sea Minstrels with those inimitable end men, Amos and Andy, Lightning and the Kingfish. The Mystic Knights of the Sea Male Chorus and Quartet with your old friend Bill Hay as interlocutor have been presented by the Pepsi and Company, makers of Pepsi and Toothpaste. Amos and Andy will be back with you Monday night at the same time with their regular episode. Pepsodin had entered the 1920s on the verge of bankruptcy. By 1928, Pepsodent was extremely profitable, thanks in no small part to Amos and Andy's popularity and the greatly increased sales that Pepsodent enjoyed because of its sponsorship. Well, Kingfish, I am glad to see you tonight. Well, Miss Hay, I'm glad to be down here tonight at the Lodge Hall, see all the brothers out there in the audience. Uh, you know, it must give the brothers a great feeling to see me up here working for them, because I is their true leader and honest brother. <laughs> Fine goings on. That's gratitude for you, Miss Hay. Because we live in enlightened times, it's jarring to hear the racist attitudes underlying Amos and Andy. There is no denying that Amos and Andy is racist. The characters were black men being played by white men and are based upon characters created in minstrel shows. Well, Andy, I see you wear your derby even in the minstrel show. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tonight's my unlike tonight, boy. I'm really going to do some unlike around here. Well, what's that? I see you got a gun strapped on your belt there. What's the idea? Never mind. Never mind, Bill. You're going to find out. Just don't stop me from unlike that's all. Not cool. Unacceptable but it's from the 1920s when America was still racist and so was entertainment. But racism alone doesn't explain why Amos and Andy were so popular. Mocking a minority can get boring pretty quick. There was something about Amos and Andy that people got attached to. America cared about the characters and wanted to tune in every night to find out how Amos and Andy dealt with the trials and tribulations of life. Listeners identified with their struggles. Yeah, well, just like I told you, Andy, it ain't much, but we want you to know that we love you and we are thinking about you, you know that. Oh, well, Amos, I feel better this Christmas than I ever felt. Yeah. Underneath the stereotypes, there was something good and decent about Amos and Andy. There was something noble about their obvious deep friendship. At its best, the Amos and Andy show could touch the heart. Yeah, well, now, you get under covers, honey. Daddy, could you get some Christmas music on the radio? Why, darling, this is the very best Christmas music you could get. This is the Lord's Prayer. I can say the Lord's Prayer with Mommy. She's been teaching it to me. Yeah, I know she is. What does the Lord's Prayer mean, Daddy? Well, it means an awful lot. And with the world like it is today, darling, it seems to have a bigger meaning than ever before. Amos and Andy premiered on the Blue Network in 1928, and to me that marks the beginning of the classic age of radio. By this time there was a third network, CBS started in 1927, but CBS didn't really have any audience to speak of until the early 1930s. For the next six years, NBC would rule the airwaves. 
Thanks especially to the incredible popularity of Amos and Andy. Tonight is another step forward in the great career of Amos and Andy. For tonight they are broadcasting over the largest network of stations in their history. I wish for Amos and Andy to welcome most heartily their old friends and the hundreds of thousands of new ones who for the first time through these increased stations can now easily hear Amos and Andy each night. Radio in America had grown in nine short years from one licensed station to hundreds of stations all over the country, connected to each other by three national networks. Radio had grown up in the 1920s, a time of optimism, partying, and easy money, and radio entertained America while the country danced, drank, and dreamed. But in October of 1929, everything went to hell. The sky-high stock market stumbled, fell, plummeted, and crashed. Billions of dollars disappeared overnight. Banks lost their depositors' life savings, and millions of people lost their jobs. The American economy ground to a halt, and people were losing hope. Radio suddenly had a new job to do. In future podcasts, we'll look at how bad things got for the American people and the ways that radio helped hold the country together and bring hope to a struggling America in the 1930s. But this show was about the 1920s, so let's end with a broadcast from 1929. Here's the Colonial Club Orchestra with a program of big band music. Note that the sponsor is Brunswick Radios, using the show to sell radios. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? To the strains of Say It With Music, we again announce Brunswick Revenues, a program sponsored by the Brunswick Bulky Colander Company of Chicago, with branches and distributors in the principal cities of the United States and the Dominion of Canada. Indeed, Brunswick has been saying it with music for two decades as the makers of the world's perfect musical instruments. This association of music with acoustics, of tone value with quality, is a guarantee of the outstanding performance of the Brunswick Radio and the Brunswick Panatrope with Radio. The new 1930 Brunswick embodies the very latest developments of radio, and among its features is a screen grid circuit using four screen grid tubes, making this instrument superior to anything that has gone before. But let a demonstration justify our words. Visit your neighborhood radio store and compare beauty against beauty, efficiency against efficiency, and performance against performance. See for yourself how ridiculous it is to consider out-of-date sets sold of necessity at cut prices when the new 1930 Brunswick may be bought for even less money. But we are anxious to begin Brunswick Brevities. Our first feature is the Colonial Club Orchestra in a medley typical of the numbers they have recorded for Brunswick. Thank you. 
xylophone is one of the most fascinating instruments in the world, and Harry Brewer, one of the best xylophonists. Now, he's going to play first a composition of his own, which he has called On the Woodpile. That's very, very catchy, Harry. Now, how about a little bit of the nimble Nola? Ladies and gentlemen, I just shut the door and Murray came through the window. So I went over and shut the window and Scanlon came through the door. What could I do? So here they are. Murray and Scanlon, as a part of Brunswick Brevities, is singing, Shut the Door, They're Coming Through the Window. B 
Be careful of your conversation on the telephone, for other people may hear things just meant for you alone. The other night the wires were crossed, and though it sounds absurd, here's a little earful of the things we overheard. Hello, hello. Operator, what's the matter? What did you do? Go back to bed? No, get off the wire. You're on a busy line. Hello, is it the sheriff's office? Yes, it's the sheriff speaking. Say, I live up in Hackensack in a house down by the sea. Oh, you live up in Hackensack. Well, why blame that on me? Oh, there are 20 crooks around the house. Oh, sheriff, I need you. Now, don't you get excited, son, and I'll tell you what to do. Yes? Shut the door. But they're coming through the window. Then shut the window. Look, they're coming through the door. Oh, shut the door. Look, they're coming through the window. Oh, the room is full and won't hold any more. Hello? <gasps> is this a menagerie? <laughs> this is Andy Gooch. Pardon me, brother. Did you say Gooch or Hooch? Don't get sarcasm. My room is full of elephants. They're colored green and pink. They're also purple monkeys, and I can't sleep a wink. Well, we'd like to take them from you, but there's no room in the zoo. They're bringing their relations now, so what am I going to do? Just shut the door. But they're coming through the window. Well, shut the window. Now they're coming through the door. Ah, uh, shut the door. But they're coming through the window. <laughs> Look, now they're coming right up through the floor. Hello, Mr. Newlywed? This is the doctor speaking. Oh, yes, 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 doctor. I called you up to say a stork brought you a son and heir. Great. Another stork brought you a girl. Well, I don't mind a pair. I see more storks circling round and think they're going to light. Oh, Doc, do me a favor, please. I'll try with all my might. Say, shut the door. But they're coming through the window. Well, shut the window. Now they're coming through the door. Doctor, please shut the door. But they're coming through the window. Oh, boy, you're in luck. They only brought you four. Good night. <laughs> Hello, hello, Wall Street, oh, 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 oh. Yes, this is Tatum and Skinham, brokers. Say, you told me to tell all my friends to buy a certain stock. I told them and they bought it, and now they're all in hot. Well, my advice to you, old man, is take it on the run. Gee, I'd like to, but they're all outside, and each one has a gun. Well, shut the door. Oh, but they're coming through the window. Oh, then shut the window. Now they're coming through the door. Can't you shut the door? Help! They're coming through the window. That's all there is, there isn't any Colonial Club Orchestra brings you some up-to-the-second popular numbers. Let's see. There's If I Can't Have You, I'll Close My Eyes to the Rest of the World, and oh, you'll recognize the rest.
This has been When Radio Ruled, podcast number one, the beginnings of radio, the 1920s. Featured songs of the era were Kitten on the Keys, recorded in 1921 by Zez Comfrey and his orchestra. Bright Eyes by Leo Reisman and his orchestra, 1921. I Wish I Could Shimmy Like My Sister Kate, recorded by the Virginians in 1922. Paul Whiteman and his orchestra. I'll Build a Stairway to Paradise. Paul Whiteman and his orchestra, 1922. Banana Oil, Von De Leith. 1925. Cornette Chop Suey, Louis Armstrong, 1926. Potato Head Blues, Louis Armstrong, 1927. Ain't Misbehavin'. Louis Armstrong, 1929. Shaking the Blues Away, Ruth Edding, 1927. When You're Smiling, Louis Armstrong, 1929. because I think Satchmo is a national treasure. West End Blues, Louis Armstrong, 1928. Special thanks to KDKA, archive.org, otr.net, and grimreaper2u at yahoo.com. I'm Mike Gillette, writer and producer. When Radio Ruled is a Before TV production. Copyright 2013.